You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. Hey everybody, welcome back to Shoe and Show, the Footwear Industries podcast, where we talk about all things footwear, especially the business side of our industry, um, which is obviously huge. It's in a huge churn right now, Matt. Um, we've got a lot of things changing. Um, but one thing that has you know been on the forefront for the past couple of years is we've seen e-commerce rise even before you know kind of the lockdown and, and saw really spikes in e-commerce was this idea of how easy it is to counterfeit kicks, knock off kicks, uh, and get yeah. into the country and sell them on all these different platforms and seemingly be in the darkness and not really um, you know brands not may may not know what you're doing out there actually. Uh, they do know what you're doing. And, and I guess, Matt, the big fear that we see from brands right now is as we see economic contraction happen and, and recessions, that's really when counterfeits kind of kind of kick it up a notch. Right. Yeah, I think that is one of the the interesting things about counterfeits is that there are some market dynamics at play, Andy, that really drive human behavior around purchasing and knocking off counterfeit product and selling that worldwide. And with the explosion of e-commerce, the as we've talked about numerous times in this program, the opportunity to, to buy and sell counterfeit goods is rampant. Um, and so I think it's so important to have someone on your team internally, particularly for an iconic brand, to be thinking about a proper strategy to, com- to combat those counterfeit sales and just overall brand protection, not just around counterfeits, but you know, there's a lot of friction between uh, brands in our industry and other companies and brands in our industry that kind of follow some set trends and some follow trends. And there's natural friction between those companies, as, as we all know. Yeah, exactly right. And so who do we have? Uh, who do we have today to, to kind of help talk about this from a brand perspective on what they're doing, what they see in the marketplace, um, kind of forecast some things out for us? Yeah, we we're, we're going to do a little cross pollination with one of our other wildly successful programs, right. Coffee Andy, yeah. as you know. Um, and so I had a conversation with Santa, Sarah Vanderhoff, who's the Associate General Counsel Global Brands at at Adidas Group out in Portland. And she and I spent about twenty minutes talking about Adidas's strategy around counterfeits, uh, the importance of having a global strategy to engage the importance even as a new brand to be establishing best practices as it relates to protecting your brand and then also like just interesting tidbits about how the company has different marketing goals around different types of product and the more that that product is marketed uh, the, the more likely it's going to be knocked off so you create consumer awareness in the marketplace via marketing and that in turn creates uh, an increase in, in counterfeits and knockoffs for those specific products, which I thought was a really interesting correlation. But um, with that, I want to have everyone have a listen to the conversation. And so, Blake, roll the tape. Welcome back to another edition of Kicks Over Coffee, where we have casual conversations over coffee with our friends in the footwear industry. I'm extremely excited to have Sarah Vanderhoff, who's the Associate General Counsel uh, for global brands and trademarks at Adidas. Sarah, welcome to Kicks Over Coffee. It's great to have you on the program. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good so, to be here. what are you drinking right now, coffee wise? Is it Stumptown? That seems to be the requirement in Portland. You know, it's actually Pete's and it's just okay. black. I'm a pretty boring um, coffee drinker. Are you just straight up black all the time? Just easy, efficient. Yeah, that is very efficient. I've, I've gotten kind of bored with my coffee choices over uh, the pandemic. So I started making brewing Vietnamese coffee, which is like a little um, little French press that goes over your glass and you put condensed milk in the bottom, which is very sweet. Oh. And then you brew it and you stir it up and you put ice in it. And the first time I ever had iced coffee was on a work trip, a footwear work trip to Vietnam. And, uh, and now I've learned to do it at home. It's not too difficult. So, um, 
you have to mix it up to uh, make your way through this. Um, as we get started, I wanted to ask you if there's official company policy around how to pronounce Adidas. Sometimes I say Adidas. Sometimes I feel like I'm in, in, you know, in groups where I have to say Adidas. What is the official company policy as it, as it relates to pronouncing the name of your company? I mean, the, the technical pronunciation is Adidas because mm-hmm. that was it's, it's the name of our founder whose name was Adi Dossler. Right. Um, however, as you know, in America, we say Adidas. And so many colleagues here say Adidas. Some say Adidas. It, it's either or. You don't Do you get fired a, for pronouncing it Adidas. Do you have a preference on your end? Um, I, I use Adidas. That's just what I've always said. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Well, that's that's my go-to until I always feel like I need to kind of up my footwear game. I, I pivot over to Adidas depending on who I'm with. But uh, yeah. the other thing that people always get wrong is the lowercase a. So even in like legal briefing, it's always a lowercase a, even if it starts the sentence, which just throws people off. It does. You know, what's frustrating about that. And I, that's something I do know, but when I'm trying to post something and tag someone on LinkedIn or I'm writing in a word document, it auto corrects every single time. Even Microsoft doesn't understand that Adidas or Adidas has a lowercase a that's frustrating. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Now let's get to kind of what your day job is, because one of the things that we're focused on as an organization, as an industry is ensuring that our members and our companies are well equipped to tackle counterfeits. Now, a lot of companies would love to have a counterfeit problem, even though it's very difficult. And I think as people will learn throughout this conversation, your job is not an easy one, but when you are counterfeited and knocked off, um, you often have a brand people want and desire globally. So Tell me kind of what your day job is and how do you prioritize the strategy around going after counterfeits for Adidas? Yeah, no, you're, you hit the nail on the head. It's a, it's a double edged sword to have a counterfeit problem because it does mean your brand is popular and demanded. And that's a good thing. Um, Anti-counterfeiting is a, 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 not the biggest part of my job, but when it said, do you want me to focus on just the counterfeiting piece? I think wherever this conversation goes for counterfeiting trademarks, wherever you want to take it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Well, I'll focus on the counterfeiting um, piece. Um, And the way that we look at anti-counterfeiting is we try to look at it from kind of a, a consumer standpoint, because at the end of the day, that's who we're trying to protect or the people that are trying to find our real products and are finding counterfeits. And so a lot of our uh, strategy is kind of built around that idea, like how do consumers look for our products? Where do they shop? Uh, How will they run across counterfeits? Um, And so when I started in this role um, 10 years ago now, I didn't uh, have a lot of anti-counterfeiting experience. And then um, a lot of our efforts were focused around physical stores, right? So we were going in and doing raids in um, known counterfeit districts in different cities. We were doing market sweeps where we would actually physically go and shop in lots of cities in in the United States. Um, And it's really shifted, right? Because counterfeits shift what they're doing based on kind of the direction of the industry and commerce generally. So a lot of our work has moved online Um, So we do a lot of of work against online counterfeiters, whether that's a standalone website um, that's, you know, offering counterfeits for sale or um, someone offering a counterfeit on a a platform. Um, So that's kind of what we're doing. Now, you know, one of the things you've said to me, I've heard this analogy from from several others of your several of your colleagues in the industry, but it's a -a whack-a-mole operation, right? And it's are there days where you think like you're ahead of the head of the ball and you you've, you're able to kind of get ahead of these trend lines and you're able to kind of shut things down appropriately and effectively, uh, or are a lot of your days kind of feel like you're continuously playing catch up. I think as an industry, we feel somewhat that way with the explosion of e-commerce and the internet, as you said, but mm-hmm. kind of how, how do you envision this thing long-term? Is this going to continue to be a whack-a-mole problem for the near future? I think yes and no. Um, And we joke amongst my team that like it's job security, like there will always be this problem that it will always be changing and evolving and we'll always have to to catch up to it. Um, But one example just of trying to get ahead of it. um, I don't know if you remember the days of UDRP where you could file a UDRP complaint and just kind of get the domain name taken down. Um, Well, that that's like 
truly whack-a-mole or writing to a registry and saying this domain is infringing our mark, take it down because you're really only taking down the domain name and you're not doing anything to hurt the guy behind the website, right? The website stays intact. All the SEO that was built up or paid for stays intact and they just shifted it to another domain name essentially. Yeah. Um, and so we, we, we do try to get ahead of that. Um, I think I talked to you last time about a, um, litigation program that we started where we've started saying, look, like we don't just want the domain taken down. We want to hurt these guys. We want to get the money that they're making. We want to freeze their entire website. And so that was kind of a way to kind of get ahead of them a little bit. And so when we did get the websites taken down, we got the whole website taken down. Um, uh, we froze all of the assets in their accounts ultimately have those transferred back to us in the form of damages. And so there are, there are ways to get ahead of it, which is interesting and exciting to think about um, as, as this evolves. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've had several members have that same issue. Merrill comes to mind, um, had the opportunity to testify on Capitol Hill at a hearing last year about this issue specifically. And there was a Merrill hyphen online.com selling product for I mean, upwards of 18 months that they were going through the process of having the URL taken down and seeking the damages. I think the probably the most famous case, not within our industry, but is Madonna having someone taken Madonna.com and her legal battles over that. So this is a landscape that has multiple jurisdictions, um, players that are located all over the world who you don't have line of sight into who they actually are. And so I think that makes it all the more difficult. But what we do know is that we're selling gangbusters online now, and particularly particular during this time with, the, with COVID. How do you approach kind of your own direct to consumer, which you control all the kind of variables and all the, the walls that protect your product in that environment? And you balance that out with working with third party platforms and online sellers who are authorized. And then beyond that, the unauthorized sellers. I mean, there has to just be so many different channels that you have to keep an eye on. Yeah. And, you know, to, to the point about the how consumers behave, that's that's what dictates where our priorities are. So we'll go in. We work with our colleagues in um, digital marketing and the business and say, OK, what? what are the search terms that drive people the most to our site? Like, what are people looking for? Like what products are hot? What do they want? And then we, we use those search terms with others um, and look and see what kind of counterfeit listings pop up in the first couple of pages of that search, because that's what consumers are really going to see, right? They're not going to click through 10 pages of Google searches to find a website that's selling something cheap. Right. Um, and so, you know, while we definitely get people that will send us leads to websites that are kind of one-offs and, and we'll deal with those, our main priority is like what consumers actually are seeing. Um, and then when it comes to our, to your point about authorized sellers, we do work with a lot of partners who are authorized to sell online. Um, and we, we want to keep the market clean for them. Right. So, um, you know, if our priority is on Amazon, then that's uh, from a business standpoint, then that's where our priority is going to be when it comes to anti-counterfeiting and keeping that platform clean. Let's talk about some of your more, um, your higher profile products. And it, it can be specific to footwear. It can be outside the footwear space. But as you think about what's out there and what people are are knocking off or selling um, in an unauthorized manner? Uh, is it around Yeezy? Is it around Stan Smith? Is it M -M NMD? What, which of the silhouettes and, and um, is it around the boost technology? Which of the, te the technologies and silhouettes and trends are you tracking the most? And are there products in your repertoire that are just kind of, you know what, they're, they're selling well, they're high volume, but they're not a part of kind of the overall counterfeit trademark knockoff space? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty connected, right? The products that sell well are the products that get knocked off. Um, and, you know, one of the most consistent trends, of course, is Yeezy. Uh, yeah. It's a super popular, um, scarce product. And so, you know, whenever you've got scarcity, which of course, as a brand, we is an intentional business strategy right. um, that counterfeiters come out of the woodwork. So Yeezy is definitely one of the the trends. Um, uh, I would say also a pretty consistent trend is around uh, soccer jerseys. Um, we yeah. see a lot of counterfeit soccer jerseys um, on the footwear side, Ultra Boost, um, Stan Smith for a little while. Um, when we relaunched, you know, we had a big relaunch anniversary of, of Stan Smith a few years ago. So I anticipate a lot of that around Superstar this year and next, um, given the big anniversary around Superstar. 
Um, but it, it does, um, there are those ones that kind of stay consistent over time, but then there also are, you know, if we have a big splash with a product, then we have to shift gears. Um, and we try to stay connected to our business uh, for that to say, hey guys, what what are you spending all your money marketing next year so that we can be prepared um, in protecting it and you know, the anti-counterfeiting work. That's a really good point, right? It's the brand awareness that's built with marketing spends that create interest and counterfeit. I mean, it's, it's human nature. You throw something in front of someone enough, you, you increase sales and then the counterfeiters swoop in and try to make a dime off that. So that, that makes a lot of sense to stay ahead of it. You know, one of the things I would like to get your help on is advising brands who might be starting out, uh, who might be just launching, maybe they're just D to C right now. And I would name names, but there's a couple out there that we know that are, that are merging and are exciting and they have some really great product. I think you're doing a, a collab uh, with one of them. Um, what's your kind of guidance if you're starting out to be thinking critically and, and innovatively about building a brand protection strategy, right? Because it's one thing to do it when you have a huge conglomerate, your global conglomerate, and you're trying to pick and choose and prioritize. But if you're just starting out and you can lay fresh groundwork uh, that that will reap benefits in the near term and the long term, um, kind of what are some things that brands should be thinking about as it relates to this space? Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is just making sure they're buttoned up on the protection front, right? You can't do anti-counterfeiting work if you don't have any rights to enforce. And so um, the, the rights ownership process takes time. Um, and I think building that into your um, business strategy is important and it gets overlooked a lot. I think people think, oh, I'll deal with that later. Um, and then all of a sudden you've got a problem. You're like, oh, my application is still, you know, being examined. Mm -hmm. um, and then anticipating growth. Um, again, and, you know, obviously by jurisdiction, uh, the rules are different in terms of whether you have use requirements for trademarks, for example. But right. if you might not be thinking about selling in Latin America today, but you might be in a couple of months or 18 months down the road and anticipating where you need to be protected um, in order to prevent you know, knockoffs when they pop up. Yeah, no, that's a great point. The use requirement is really interesting because there are jurisdictions that don't require it. I know there's some really famous cases in China where where folks have, have registered trademarks and just squatted on them, sat on them. Uh, there's the famous Jordan case, the Zhao Dan case that went all the way to the Chinese Supreme Court. Are you seeing from a global perspective uh, improvement in the legal landscape as it relates to protection of trademarks and intellectual property or is there a degradation or is it about the same? How would you judge kind of the global landscape? Um, I don't know. I probably pretty status quo. I mean, your point yeah. about China is a good one. I mean, that's where you should protect your mark immediately because right. people are just waiting to, to squat on marks. Um, I'm not responsible for um, protection in different jurisdictions. So I'm not an expert on kind of, where the legal requirements have changed or not. Um, but, you know, I think that there are governments, I mean, in Europe and in the U S that have, um, that care about intellectual property and try to help brands, um, you know, deal with this issue for sure. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Um, the last area I want to explore is competition within our own, the own four walls of our industry. Uh, your background is one of our more famous cases with Adidas and Payless. Um, and there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of at any given moment. One of our members is suing the other member on some kind of infringement. How do you view kind of the competitive landscape in within, I'll call what I'll call legitimate product development and trade where these aren't counterfeiters or knockoffs. These are companies that are competing and fashion is, doesn't always have really stark lines, but there are, there are also some really key demarcation lines between products. Um, how would you kind of rate the overall environment here in the U S as it relates to brands competing against each other for different looks, silhouettes, colorways, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I think there's different categories of, um, competitors, right? I mean, the Nikes of the world, we have a ton of respect and admiration for They're innovators. They're creating new things. They don't, they don't want to copy. Um, and I think that's how we approach our business. We want, we are the original brand, right? We want to create new things and innovate. Um, and so I think there is a lot of great mutual respect amongst, um, you know, 
at least that competitive set. Um, and then there are other competitors in the industry who don't invest in research and development or innovation and do kind of ride the trends and, and copy things. And I don't think it's any secret that we have gone after people like that, that are probably, you know, members are considered, you know, in our industry. Um, right. So, yeah, I think it just depends on which kind of competitive set you're looking at and what the, the relationship is. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, there is there are the innovators, the trailblazers. Uh, you all obviously come to mind, Nike. And then, then there are those who want to feel the need to try to democratize some of those trends in some way. Uh, and again, it's a really tricky line. A lot of those companies kind of run down. Um, and so it's to have a healthy environment where there can be challenges in the courts. I don't think it's a bad thing. Every time I see a story in footwear news or elsewhere about some kind of lawsuit, um, it just shows the importance of protecting your brand, the importance, importance of engaging the legal system if you see the need to do so. So um, there's so many jobs tied into innovation. There's so much R&D that goes into this. There's so many amazing aspects of developing, you know, an 18 to 24 month cycle to develop a pair of shoes, just things that will blow your mind. Um, that you have to protect it at all costs because it means jobs and profitability and return to shareholders and, and ad additional funds to do key research and development. So, um, and again, it does go back to the consumer for us too, right? Like it's, right. I think it's hard sometimes to know how close can you get to the line without crossing it to where consumers then think your product is affiliated or associated with someone else. Um, and at the end of the day, that's what we're, trying to protect against, right? We don't want consumers to see something and think it's ours when it's right. not. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Well, Sarah, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us, walking us through some of the things you have your eye on as it relates to intellectual property protection, trademarks, counterfeits. It's, it's a very complex world. And, and when the door was open for e-commerce and direct to consumer and and engagement uh, across all channels It opened the door and the avenues for all the counterfeit and uh, illicit activity that we've, we used to just see localized in certain markets around the world. Uh, and so thank you so much for coming on this edition of kicks over coffee. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It was really great. And I don't, I don't think I gave you credit for your, um, your shirt on the air. So I love it. It looks great. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's one of the things. I, I'm an NC State grad. Um, I have family that go to Nike schools or went to Nike schools. It's fun to have that competition. But we've been in a, an Audi school for for as long. I've, I've been long gone for 25 years. So we've been there for a long time and uh, and always have great looks every single season. So uh, if you have any if you have any kind of part in protecting that, I, I, I appreciate it. So. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thanks well, again. Folks, yeah, no problem. Uh, this has been another edition of Kicks Over Coffee. We encourage you to go to kicksovercoffee.com to check out all the latest editions as we explore a variety of different topics impacting our industry with legal experts and design experts and customs experts across the board. Uh, until next time, we will see you on the next Kicks Over Coffee. All right, Matt. Great job. Uh, hugely interesting conversation around brand Thanks, protection, brother. IP, counterfeits. Uh, folks uh, can go to kicksovercoffee.com and, and see Matt's beautiful face on there on the video version <laughs> and many other uh, interviews that we do are uh, kicks over coffee uh, as I'm drinking coffee right now, actually. Um, but I think it's hugely important to consider not just how we're engaging consumers and how we're changing backroom operations, but honestly, you know, going forward in a digital world, there's going to be a lot more opportunity for 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 you know IP theft or counterfeits or anything like this in ways that we can't even anticipate. So we have to put our best foot forward now and start to build robust programs around that. So great job, Matt, for the convo. Um, and with that, you know, uh, we, before we leave the episode, we want to bring in Jasmine um, and have one of our world famous sessions on fashion footwear in focus. Jasmine, how are things going? Good. So, you know, everything is heating up. I think when, like, just thinking about Adidas, um, I think about Adidas more during the summertime than I say, like, maybe the fall, um, just because they always have, like, nice, lightweight, lightweight uh, walking shoes and things like that. Um, although, like, the time we're in right now, we're not seeing a whole bunch of new products, but um, I, I'm starting to see some of my favorite, like the MMDs on their website in different colorways. Um, they also have a new release with 
uh, Pharrell and this is like a shoe that I've never kind of seen before. This is maybe like their sixth or so release with Pharrell um, as far as a shoe collaboration and it's like very funky colors, like a high top shoe which you don't really see from Adidas so I'm interested to see if they're going to be rolling out any new products but um, I know for me Adidas is definitely a go-to for um, summer shoes and walking around and it seems like we're going to be doing a lot a lot of outdoor just walking and bike trails and things like that this year so um, I'm definitely on Adidas as far as like my fashion interest for right now. Now Jasmine let me ask you this we know our good friend and brother in footwear arms Andy is a huge boost fan and for those of you who follow him on LinkedIn <laughs> one of Andy's favorite playgrounds, as is mine, on, on the social media networks. Uh, he made his own pair of Adidas <laughs> Boost mules, <laughs> which like totally screams quarantine, innovation, and horror all on like the same thing. So, Andy, walk us through your mindset as you were creating those. And Jasmine, once he's done, you can tell us if they're fashionable. <laughs> I can tell you they're not fashion because my wife told me they weren't. So that that's right off the bat. She she gave me a real nasty look about what I was doing. Um, but <laughs> I, I in essence had worn I had worn my boo shoes out. Right at, at some point, you look at the bottom and you realize the tread is basically worn off, and it's time to move on to the next pair. So I sit there looking at it, and typically what I do with my old shoes is I either donate them to Souls for Souls. Or I just use them for like yard work so they can get like really cruddy and nasty. And then I'll throw them out after I completely demolish the shoe. But at this point, I was just like, you know what? It's it's hot out. Jasmine keeps talking about slides. So I just thought, what if I just cut the shoe? So I took like a razor blade and I uh, took a saw, kind of sawed off the back of it basically in half. And, uh, you know, took it down to the bone. It's pretty comfortable. I mean, it's what I do to take the trash out or go pick up the mail. So, uh, you know. Maybe it's not fashionable, but you know, it's, it's, it, it is innovative. I got a lot totally. of likes. Yeah, I got totally a lot of likes. I do think, um, but I got the idea because I was reading um, someone on LinkedIn. Um, uh, I think D had posted it about Converse was making a shoe where the, the, the back is basically flat. So you get a, a Converse All Star flat back. So you just slide it, your foot straight into it. And I was just like, well, I could make a shoe from existing collections. So sustainability, innovation, um, and a little touch of polk, you know, kind of made my own. <laughs> Adidas and I do think Adidas should look at that. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm sure they could make them much better than me and slicker, but it is a good prototype for what could be for kind of casual, you know, why just have a EVA outsole or whatever that's plastic for your slides when you can actually have real comfortable slides and sell a little bit too. That's I don't know. Question. I have a funny story. I'll tell you off, off the air about a uh, conversation with Adidas about your mules, but, uh, Oh, that's not good. That is not <laughs> good at all. Am I going to get a letter? No, uh, no, you're good. all good. You're good. <laughs> the Jasmine, is it fashionable? Yeah. Even though it may not be the most, um, aesthetically pleasing, it's a great concept and just not perfect execution. I can see it happening. And then I hope they credit you if they do decide to move forward with that kind of shoe. <laughs> well, I hope so too. I doubt they will, but you know, little old me sitting here and resting in my own workshop, making these things, sweating it out. Uh, I do. Before we go, Jasmine, I do have a question because you mentioned all the colorways that people are coming out with for the summer. And I just can't get behind this concept where I heard one, a couple of analysts come out and talk about, well, like during COVID, when we all come out of this and like maybe we don't have as much money in our pockets and we want something that's, you know, more long term. And so think of seasonless kind of footwear where it would be like kind of monotone colors. And it just doesn't it just doesn't jive with me. It seems clever and it doesn't seem accurate, right? I think sometimes people are trying to be clever and like make a like get their get get their ideas out there, but I think I think maybe it's more about durability, making shoes that are more durable so that they last longer than a season. So this like like yeah. The idea around fashion maybe isn't this fast fashion like we once had. Maybe it's two seasons instead of one, so it's more sustainable in that term. But I can't imagine people just being like, yeah, I'll just take the gray pair over different colors they could have on their feet. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, so I mean, I, I haven't 
seen like a I've seen different colorways and more like traditional shoes. So just how everybody like repurchased Converse or how you said like how you repurchase your Adidas Boost. I'm starting to see more colorways in that direction. But as far as like new shoes or shoes that may not be as popular, I am seeing more like monotone, just the black, just the white, just the gray. Um, so I, I don't know how I'm interested to see. Cause like I said, seeing those Pharrell shoes on there and it's so different than what Adidas has done in the past. Um, everything from the material to the color choices, just everything. So even though you heard that, I don't know. I feel like we may be surprised and start seeing new product from brands that we're not, you know, accustomed to seeing from them. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think people are going to want to get out and express themselves visually and just the monotone stuff doesn't cut it. So you might see some pastels, you might see some, you know, some hot pinks or things that are just people, you know, I don't know. I just feel like drab is, is kind of, over. I'm, we're all over the drab, I think. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks very much, Jasmine. And I want to thank everybody for taking a listen today to our super important discussion around brand protection. Again, in a, in a new age that we're entering into, It's more important than ever because people become more innovative and more clever about how they do knockoffs, how they, you know, you know, trademark infringement, things like that digitally, where they where they sell shoes online and different platforms that may start popping up. Um, So it's one of those things to, to be super cognizant of as we go forward, because we can't always look to the past to instruct what's going to come. Um, So things will come at us in a different way. Um, just like we're having to reform all our business models around um, around COVID and quarantine and reopenings and not reopenings, et cetera. So, um, so thanks again for listening. Uh, I encourage everyone to go to shoeandshow.com to see our full library of over 200 episodes uh, interviewing experts and leading footwear executives on a range of topics. Um, it's, it's a real interesting mix of ideas and conversations in our industry. And even though we're in this kind of new era, many of the many of the conversations are still super relevant to the basics of our business uh, and the footwear industry. So please go do that. Um, but again, thank you for listening. Until next time, on behalf of Jasmine and Matt, Shoe In is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit fdra.org.